Hi, Patricia with Buzz and Bark Animals, and we're going to be talking about why the working breed dogs might not be the dog for you, and why they tend to end up in shelters, or stray, or in worse places. And if you're an um, experienced dog person, dog guardian, I don't like to say owner, because I don't think anybody should be owned then this video does not apply to you, but you might get some good argument points that you can use on other people that you know who are going to get one of these working breeds and you don't feel like they are a good candidate for that. Because there is nothing more tragic than a dog ending up in a shelter because the people couldn't handle that breed. I'm also going to talk about the different phases of a dog's development and how that also affects whether they end up in a shelter or not. So this is kind of a two-part video. First I'm going to talk about the working breeds and then I'm going to talk about the development of dogs and why they don't get adopted in those development stages or why they get dumped in a shelter or on the street or where some people actually kill their dogs um, in different countries because they just don't want them anymore. It's really sad. But before we get into the video, remember to subscribe, like, share, and leave a comment. Okay, so let me get started on the topic. Okay, working breeds, it's pretty obvious. They're dogs that were originally bred to do a job. So this includes Doberman Pinschers, all the German Shepherd breeds, you know, the Belgian Shepherd, the, the French, the, was it a Malinois, the one from... Um, Turkey, uh, there's, there's different types of equivalents to German Shepherds around the world. Um, all the hunting dogs, it, well, mainly the bigger ones, although they, I would make an exception with the Labrador Retriever and the Golden Retriever and the Beagle and the Basset Hound, because I, I just did another video on how those are easier breeds. But for the most part, uh, some of the Terriers were originally bred to be working dogs, uh, the Datsun, is not the easy breed that everybody thinks it is because they think oh it's a small dog and all small dogs are easy to take care of um no that's not true that's that's a myth and you know some of those dogs also end up in shelters um mainly the most popular working breeds are the well you have the australian um shepherd you have all, all the shepherds all all the um herding dogs basically including the border collie are working breeds that um, the cattle, um, the Australian cattle herding dog, also the blue healer, the same same breed, except one's more blue and the other one's more white, um, but they're related. Uh, the hunting dogs, again, the Weimaraner, the Visla, the German short hair pointer, the English pointer, the, um, I don't know what I'm saying, um, there's another one that goes in that category, I can't remember who it is. Um, the, uh, I guess the Irish Wolfhound is another dog that was, I mean, it's not a high energy dog, so that one's probably okay. It's just a, it's a large breed. Um, then there's the, the Cane Corsa, which I, I, I would never want one, but you know, a lot of people like them. The Rottweiler was originally a, a working dog. Um, the Pitbull was originally a working dog. There's, there's, um, I think it was the Bull Terrier, and then there's the Bulldog, and then there's kind of the... The mixture of them and so there's like there's kind of like three different dogs within that that sort of pit bull um, category and I think one of them might have been a family dog and the other ones were all working dogs and then poodles were originally working dogs I'm not talking about the toy poodle or the teacup poodle I'm talking about the standard poodle that was a hunting dog uh, the Portuguese water dog is another um, you don't see them around ever uh, of course the huskies the sled dogs the Police dogs, the um, dogs that are, uh, then there's the dogs that are, you know, I've mentioned some of them already, the more muscular, larger dogs, the St. Bernard was a working dog, the Burmese, um, I can't think of the Burmese, I can't remember the name of the rest of it is, um, they were a Burmese mountain dog, um, they were working dogs, and so when you go to a shelter, and you're walking to the shelter, besides seeing a lot of mixed breed dogs, which is probably your best bet, really. And you're going to have the best temperament with a mixed breed. You're going to have um, less of the genetic problems. 
I mean, there may be some of that, but not as much. You're going to have um, probably live a longer life because they're not going to have all the health um, issues that come with um, the pure breeding. So you'll find a lot of mixed breeds. And then you'll find Huskies, you'll find German Shepherds, you'll find Malinois, you'll find, um, you don't see too many Weimaraners, occasionally there'll be one. Um, German short hair pointers are showing up in shelters and foster programs in big numbers right now. I think part of that is all the YouTube videos that feature them. They are a really cool dog. I fostered one. He's a, he was a senior when I fostered him, so I didn't get the puppy stage. I didn't get the adolescent. I didn't get when he would have been even way more energetic. I got when he was a little bit more mellow, but he was still high energy. Um, not an easy breed. I mean, I would love to have another one, but I, to be honest with myself, I don't think I actually can manage them, at least not at this stage of my life. Um, so uh, Greyhound is another dog, very high energy dog, obviously was used for racing, uh, very thin dog. You don't want it to get fat because it's going to get a lot of health issues. Um, that's for a very special person. That definitely would not be for a beginner um, pet owner. Um, you know, even if you're trying to help out a cause or something, you're actually going to do more harm than good if you don't know the breed, if you don't know the requirements of the breed, if you're not going to hire a trainer, if you're not going to do socialization, if you don't have the time to, to deal with vet visits, to deal with all these things. And what you need to do is you need to research the heck out of whatever breed you're interested in. Um, look up grooming, like what are the grooming requirements? What are the dietary requirements? How many calories a day do they need? What kind of foods do they need? Um, what kind of health issues are you going to run into with that breed? You know, because when you see a dog show or you see like people walking their dogs down the street or whatever, you need to start asking them some really difficult questions. I mean, if you don't know them very well, you probably have to get to know people before you start asking them personal questions about your dog. But you can ask them about the breed, like what do you know about this breed? Because they're going to give you the pros and they're going to give you the cons because they have the experience on a daily basis, like what are your vet bills like? I mean, not that you're trying to get their budget or their finances, you know, you got to be really careful about questions like that. But how much is this dog costing you to take care of for a whole year? And that includes everything from bedding to crates to food to, um, again, vet bills. Um, some dogs need grooming, other dogs don't need grooming, um, but then you may want somebody to do the bathing on them, especially if they're a really big dog, um, but short hair. Um, like you have to get special vacuum cleaners, you gotta get all this flea stuff and tick stuff for your house because you know they're gonna bring in fleas and ticks um, because it just it's a problem now, those insects are everywhere. And, you know, how are you going to deal with all this stuff? And are you going to be able to rearrange your house so that they're not going to bite into something dangerous like a poisonous plant? Or how, how, what are you willing to spend money on? Because some of these dogs are also escape artists. So if you're not exercising, say, a husky or a Samoyed, I know I have witnessed people's dogs running away. And there was one Samoyed dog that ran away all the time and nearly got hit by cars. So if you don't have the time in your schedule or you don't have the energy to take these dogs out running or to a park or to the beach or wherever it is that you need to go and get them exercise, then you don't want one of these dogs. I mean, yeah, they're beautiful. And then you got to wonder how much of your ego is involved in it. Or did you see this dog on a television program? Did you? Um, I remember when I was growing up, the collies, the long-haired collie um, was... I can't remember what they call them, rough collies, I think, is, is the one with the long hair. And then there's also the smooth collie. I get them mixed up. Anyways, the Lassie dog. They were extremely popular, and so were the Shelties. And a lot of people were going and getting them. And the other dog that was really popular was the Cocker Spaniel. And then, of course, the Labrador Retriever has always been popular. And then there was a lot of Terriers when I was growing up. I remember in Airedale Terriers and Schnauzers and... Um, all the rest of that. But, you you know, you, terriers are smaller dogs, just like the Dotson's a smaller dog. But you can run into a lot of problems with these with these breeds. Um, I've seen like, this one video was really funny, and they said that the Dotson's like on the list of the most stubborn breeds, and they are. They're very stubborn. And they bark constantly. And if you're living in an apartment, you're thinking, oh, I can get a small dog, I'll get a Dotson. That's a big mistake, because those dogs are going to bark as soon as you leave the house. Your neighbors are going to be completely pulling their hair out. They're going to complain about you. You might get evicted. 
if you're in a condo, same situation, even if you own the condo, they're going to want you removed or the dog removed or something. Because those dogs, I, I, we lived next door to um, a family that had one of those dogs. It was a long-haired dog. It's a really cute dog, but dang, it barked all day and all night. And it gets to the point where it's just grating on your nerves, and they could not get that dog to stop barking. I mean, they brought it in the house, but then it would just bark in the house. They bark all the time. So if you're deaf, maybe you can handle it, or if you're not noise sensitive, but then if you're living near other people and they're gonna to have to listen to the barking, they're gonna complain. So that's something to consider. The other thing that Dotsons have that's a problem is they're being overbred to have, I don't think their backs, the way their backs are now. So they're having a lot of back issues. Um, a lot of the breeds that were popular when I was growing up have been overbred. And so nobody had any of these genetic or these health problems with these breeds when I was growing up or even when I was a young adult. And now they are because the breeders want to change the shape or they want to like the dog to have a longer back. Uh, German Shepherd has a lot of um, hip dysplasia because now they have the, you can see how they slope instead of having a straight back. Like when I was growing up, the German Shepherds had straight backs. Now they have this sort of slope and they end up with hip problems, they end up with back problems, um, you end up having to put them down uh, because they can no longer handle the pain um, that they're going through. They can't get upstairs, you got to carry them upstairs, they're pretty heavy dogs, they also shed a lot. So if you're looking for a dog that's not going to shed a lot, stay away from the long-haired dogs. But also the German short hair pointer sheds a lot. They have tiny, little tiny hairs and they get in everything. I mean, you end up breathing them in your nose. You got them all over your face. It's kind of like when you go and get your hair cut and you got those little bits of hair all over you. That's what like having a German short hair pointer is. And I'm going to use that one as an example because it's the one I'm most familiar with. They're wonderful dogs for the right people. And the right person is somebody that's going to exercise them, going to feed them healthy, make sure they don't get any junk food, make sure that they're getting mental stimulation, make sure that when you take them for a walk, they're a scent hound, they need to smell everything. If you're just trying to take them around the block in 10 minutes and jerk their neck every five minutes because you don't want them sniffing anything, that's not the dog for you. Because if you were to treat the dog that way, it's going to be miserable and guess what? It's going to run away and you're gonna to have to go find the dog. It's gonna run away all the time because it needs that stimulation. It wants to be out sniffing things. It wants to be exploring. A lot of dogs want that. And if you don't believe me, there's a book, I can't remember the title of it, but it's one of Alexandria Horowitz. She has a whole series of dog books and it's the one that's about the nose of the dog and how the nose, the, the compartments in the brain that are connected to the nose and how important the nose and sniffing is to the dog and how uh, more relaxed they are when they get to do all the sniffing and all the rest of the stuff that they do. That's like a natural um, dog behavior. So the other thing to look into when you're researching is what are natural dog behaviors? Are those going to annoy you? Are those going to gross you out? Do you not want to clean up after the dog? Do you not want to have to spend like a lot of money on healthy food for them? I mean, usually people who eat junk food give their dogs junk. Um, and you know, so having a dog where you have to put them on a healthy diet, you may change your diet too and become more healthy and that dog ends up saving your life. But be really careful if you're looking for your first or even second dog. And the last time you had a dog was when you were a child, so you don't really remember how to take care of them. A lot of things have changed since you were a child, most likely. Um, there's a lot more socialization, there's better training techniques, they're very friendly, um, kind training now. You don't want the real brutal stuff because then your dog's just going to resent you. And then they're going to go to the animal communicator and they're going to resent the animal communicator and they're going to resent everybody because they're, they're going to be kind of carrying a chip on their shoulders. So just like we do, like if we were being abused as a child and we grow up with a chip on our shoulder, right? It's the same for them, except they don't dwell on it the way that we do. But it would be harder to get them to do something. They may rebel. I mean, some dogs are more rebellious than others. Again, some breeds are extremely stubborn. So research the breed. Be really honest with yourself. Take those surveys, which, you know, you put your lifestyle and, you know, not what you want to be, but who you are right now. Like, oh, yeah, I want to exercise more, but you're sitting on the couch. You have to kind of answer, yeah, I'm sitting on the couch. I'm not exercising, right? Because otherwise, 
you're gonna you're gonna bring an animal into your house that's gonna go on a rampage. You know, if you think that movie Marley and Me is based on a true story, um, you know, a lot of those uh, movies where they get these dogs that just go completely berserk, it's because they're usually not getting enough exercise, they're not getting the socialization they need, or something happened with the breeding and the dog could actually be mentally ill. So just like humans can be mentally ill, so can animals. And I remember meeting this one woman and she had a border collie that was bipolar. And I'm like, ooh, that's a bad combination. And this woman was at her wit's end. She didn't know what to do. She was taking the dog to vets and alternative healers. And she was, you know, training and this and that. And I don't know what ended up happening with the dog. I know she loved the dog, but um, she was at her wit's end. And so dogs can bring relaxation under our lives. They can bring a lot of pleasure and companionship and all those things but they can also bring high levels of stress especially if it's not the right breed like if you, if you know don't get a breed just because it's a beautiful breed and just because there's youtube channels that have that dog and you're just going oh i really want that dog because a lot of the times the people with youtube channels i've seen two kinds of people with youtube channels with dogs one of them that they really know a lot about dogs and they're good to the dogs like they give the dogs everything they need um, and almost self-sacrifice then there's the other ones who have no idea what they're doing, but they're just trying to be the next TikTok trend or whatever. And they're actually abusing their dogs without knowing that they're abusing them. And I have a friend in England who gets upset about when she sees those TikTok videos where they're actually being kind of mean to their dogs, like they're teasing them and stuff. Don't tease your dog. You can kind of tease them a little bit, but don't tease them with food and don't tease them with their toys necessarily because um, you might end up getting bitten one day. Okay, so the other thing I want to talk about really quickly is the development of a dog. And again, there are a lot of books out there um, by dog researchers, behaviorists, you know, dog behaviorists. And I would, if you don't have a dog yet and you want to get one, go and read as many of those books as you possibly can. Read books by Victoria Stilwell. I remember reading some of Cesar Milan's books. I don't agree with his training techniques, though. I think he's a bit rough on dogs. Although when I was first learning about like dog training and all the rest of that. I was reading his books and I wasn't, I, I would flinch when I'd watch some of his videos from um, his Dog Whisperer show because I just thought, God, he's really rough on those dogs. Um, and I thought that he had to be rough on them because they were like pit bulls and Rottweilers and dogs like that. But then it turns out, no, they do not need to be rough like that. But he does have a lot of good, good information though. Like if you can get past all of that. Um, but I don't believe in cruelty at all for animals. So, the developmental stage is, okay, first of all, the um, when the dog is born, and there's a really good book by, um, again, I'll mention her, Alexandria Horowitz. It's the, I think it's a year of the puppy where they get a puppy. Um, and she actually is there when the puppy's born. Like, well, she's not born in her house. It's born at a breeder, or not a breeder. It's born at a foster, has a, a pregnant dog. And then she has, caught she has like a bunch of puppies. Um, and so she goes through like when she saw the birth and then she saw all the different stages that this puppy went through but you don't want a puppy from a breeder or even a foster program you don't want the puppy to be taken away from their mother before eight weeks because the mother is going to teach the puppy socialization she's going to teach and the siblings and the combination of the siblings and the mother dog are going to teach this dog how to get along with other dogs and then there's also the handling um the person whether it's the foster or the uh, breeder, they're gonna handle the puppies too and get them used to humans. So you want the expert, whether it's the breeder or the foster program, you want the experts to do all that for the eight weeks and maybe even go as far as, I guess, 10 weeks. I think the mother starts losing interest in them around 10 weeks or something, or maybe it's eight to 10 weeks. And so then they can go and be adopted into um, different homes and things like that, but you don't really want a dog that hasn't been socialized by the mother. Now, if you're getting a dog and it's an adult dog and you're getting the dog from a shelter or a foster program, then you really don't have a choice. And But you can still, I hear, socialize them. It's a little bit more difficult and you can work with a trainer and you know it's recommended because you don't know this dog, you don't know the history of the dog half the time, and you don't want the dog being triggered by something and attacking somebody. So those are some things to remember. So then there's the whole puppy stage and um, in Horowitz's book, it's incredible like how much a dog develops from in, in just a year, like how many stages they go through in a year. So they go from being an infant to being a teenager 
to being a young adult within like a whole year if you want to compare it to like the human evolution and dogs live anywhere between six to maybe I don't know some dogs have lived up to 20 but they look pretty bad you know they're usually like really thin and arthritic and getting rolled around on something um, when they're around 20 but there there are, have been some healthier dogs though that have lived to 16 17 18 years so you're looking at like a commitment of at least six years if you're getting a dog from a puppy until it dies and ultimately you want to have that dog for if you're getting a dog as a puppy you want to take care of that dog for its whole lifetime now things happen people die um, and they have to go to a family member the family member doesn't want the dog the dog ends up going to a shelter and then ends up having to go to another family that happens um, or there's money issues but the money issues could actually be resolved because there's a lot of different organizations out there that have grants and things like that. And there's some of the um, some of the shelters even have programs because they want the dog to stay with the family. They don't want any more dogs in the shelter. So there are some different programs out there. Say you get a dog and you have some financial difficulties, you can get some help to take care of the dog. Now, some people have had to give up their dogs because they were evicted their or their the house that they're renting is being sold and now they have to find another place to live and the only thing they can find is housing where they can't have pets and so then they have to give up the pet because they can't find a relative or anybody else to take like they'll try to get their relatives and the relatives will say no and then they go to their friends and they're all the friends say i don't want a dog and then their last recourse is to take their you know their best friend or whatever to a shelter and then there are some people out there who will say, no way, I'll go live in a tent before I'll live in an apartment where I can't have my dog. So there's, you know, different things can happen and it's not really fair to blame people. But ultimately, you want to make that commitment for the whole dog's life. Now, some dogs don't live the whole time, right? They may live a year and die. They may get cancer when they're in their middle years. They may end up getting all kinds of things. Could, You know, lots of things happen to them. And so they may not live like their whole lifespan. But if, if they're going to live their whole lifespan, you want to be there from the moment you take them as a puppy all the way until they're, they're passing into uh, over the Rainbow Bridge. I mean, that's what you want to do. Um, because you wouldn't just turn out, like if you have children, you're not just going to go give your children away. I mean, some people put their children, I guess, in orphanages or whatever. Um, I mean, foster programs, you know, because they have issues that they can't deal with. Um, but for the most part, you don't really see parents giving their children away or sticking their children in a shelter or, um, you know, things like that. And a lot of people think of their dogs as part of the family. And so if you're one of those people, you definitely want that animal with you through its whole life stages. Um, and you can do that more with a dog than you can with a parrot because a parrot will live like 80 years. So the parrot's probably not going to be with the same people for its whole lifetime. Whereas a dog really does have that ability to do it. Now, cats live a long time. They can live 20 plus years. And so if you're looking for an animal that's not going to, you know, take you into three decades or two decades or whatever, um, a dog is really a good option. But then you have to look at the lifestyle of what you would need to do to be a dog person, right? Because a cat will pretty much take care of itself. Obviously, you feed the cat, give the cat water and toys and you know you don't want to ignore the cat you want to give the cat affection and have some time with the cat and play with the cat and all that other stuff but the cat doesn't need to go for a walk the cat doesn't necessarily need to go to a groomer although it kind of depends some cats do but i mean if you have like a short-haired tabby cat you don't have to take that cat to a groomer you know um good luck bathing it though um you know if you have one of those orange cats or you know the short-haired cats they don't really need to go to a groomer um, unless they have some kind of health issue or something and they need to but so but this video is not about cats it's about dogs and so the developmental stages is the dog will go through sort of an adolescent stage and according to Horowitz it was funny because she said that they get especially the female dog um, they actually menstruate and then um, so they bleed and and she had the dog had to wear like this sort of diaper thing um, and then they're kind of like she said the dog became kind of snotty like when it um, was it like an adolescent and then it kind of goes through its stage where it's just not friendly anymore it's just kind of like grumpy and stuff and then once it goes through that stage and it becomes a young adult it, it kind of goes back to being a more affectionate dog or whatever but there's different stages in, in the dog's life where 
once they get out of that cute puppyhood, a lot of people will just try to get rid of them. Like when they become, um, like if they don't socialize them correctly when they're puppies, then what happens is they, they grow, especially the bigger dogs, they're all of a sudden they got all these legs and their legs are huge and their feet are huge and they're clumsy and they knock things over and they're rough and you know they do all these kinds of things because they weren't socialized correctly they weren't trained correctly and now they're jumping on everybody which isn't cute anymore when they're like 65 pounds and you got people coming over to your house and they're being jumped on by a dog and they get licked in the face and they don't really like dogs and you know um those are not good behaviors that's why they the puppies need socialization they need training um, you know, especially if you're going to have a Great Dane or you're going to have one of these bigger breeds, you definitely, definitely need to get them training and socialization and teach them boundaries. Because if you don't, you got a liability waiting for you down the line. So I did a video on the easier dogs to have as pets, but all dogs are going to take work. They're all going to need exercise. They're all going to need mental stimulation. They all need time with you. You need to bond with them. Um, make them part of your pack, even if it's just you and the dog, um, or if it's just you and a spouse and the dog, or whatever the situation is. The dog needs to be part of the pack. It is a pack animal. And um, there's just a lot of things to consider. And then the next stage they go through is once they're over seven, although I think it's different for the um, Great Dane and the bigger dogs, the Mastiff and the Great Dane and all those dogs because they live only six or seven years. So their senior years are going to probably start around four. But for the average dog, senior years start around seven or eight. So this is when they're, they're still athletic, they're still pretty active, but you might have to change their diet at that stage. Um, they're starting to wind down. Um, some of them may live another three years. They may live 10 years, 12 years. Maybe they live as long as 15 or 16. Kind of depends on the breed. It depends on the food. It depends on how much exercise the dog's getting. It depends on whether the dog's been overweight, had any heart problems, diabetes, or you know, those are all the things to check with with the vet. Um, vet care or any kind of health care, whether you go holistic or otherwise, is extremely important. Um, you want, if there's um, a lot of diseases out there, especially for whatever breed you have, you want to make sure that that dog is getting checkups on a regular basis because if you can catch cancer early enough, you can treat it and the dog isn't going to die at a young age. But I mean, can't promise that, but I mean, you have a better chance of the dog surviving. If the dog becomes, if the dog becomes pre-diabetic, then it's time to do whatever you need to do to help that dog. Um, they're usually at that point overweight and they're eating stuff they're not supposed to be eating. Um, but they can get a lot of the same issues that humans get. So be prepared for that. And I always say, um, have a budget together. Like how much is it going to cost you to have that dog every year? And can you afford it? Because it's nice to have a dog. I mean, you get you get a lot of rewards from having a dog. They're, uh, you know, especially if you're if you really love them and you just want one really bad. And um, I've had to wait. Like I'm still waiting. I'm an adult, and I, you know, I, I have been wanting dogs for I don't know 30 years or something. But it's never been the right time. I've never had the money. I'm not living in the right place. Um, it's really a drag because I see other people with dogs and I'm jealous. Um, but that's just uh, at least I get to communicate with people's dogs. That's great. Um, so then they go through the, the senior years, which starts at seven, but then you start seeing the decline around 10, depending on the breed, and you start getting things like arthritis, um, then they need to have other, their teeth start rotting if they're not, if you're not doing do good dental care with their teeth, um, they start getting, um, those tumors, like fat tumors on their bodies, they start getting kind of like arthritic, I think I already mentioned that, um, where they're, you can see they're kind of like their bones are starting to like, um, you can see the kind of the arthritis in the bones. Um, they become slower. They may lose their hearing. They may lose their sight. Um, they may have uh, problems with their bowels or their, um, they can't control like your, you know, urinating, like they can't make it outside and they're peeing in the house and they have to wear a diaper. Um, there could be a lot of things. They're more likely to get a lot of diseases when they're older. And again, that's after, that's around maybe nine or 10 years old, depending on the breed. And then if they live past that and they get to 12, 14, 15, 16, um, there is just so many health problems and a lot of vet care. And um, you still need to socialize. I mean, you need to socialize in their whole life. Um, but most of it should be done in their puppyhood. 
But they need a new experiences all the time, I think. Otherwise, they're going to get bored. But when their seniors are winding down, they don't need as many walks. Um, the walks become shorter. They're not as playful, or they try to be playful, but then they end up hurting themselves. You know, like you twist their foot or something, you know, because they're trying to run after a frisbee, but they've got arthritis. Um, it's really, it gets really sad as they get older. Um, and then you realize how much pressure your time is with them. And when they start getting to the senior years, you really do want to spend more time with them. But what people do is they say, oh, my dog is old, my dog's unattractive, my dog's not athletic anymore, I'm going to dump the dog off in a uh, shelter. Well, that's really tragic because that dog has committed itself to that family. And now they don't want to pay for the vet bill, so they just don't want the dog anymore because they don't think the dog is attractive. And, you know, we all get old. How would we like it if we got tossed out, you know, because we're older? In fact, people do do that to their humans, which is cruel. Um, so I don't think, like, I don't think, like, the real dog people would do that. I think the people who do that are superficial, and I don't mean to be so judgmental, but it, they really cause me to feel angry. Because what happens to those dogs if they end up in a regular shelter is they get put down because nobody wants to adopt them. And it's through no fault of their own. They've dedicated their lives. They've committed to a family. They've been there during the tough times. They've been there for, you know, they give us more than we give them, even though we think we're spending a lot of money on them. They're really giving us much more. So I get I feel really angry when people dump off senior dogs because they want a puppy. And there was one shelter, and I can't remember where it was, but I remember I was talking to one of the volunteers there, and they said that somebody brought in a senior dog, and then they immediately went over to where the puppies were and said they wanted to adopt a puppy. And the shelter gave them the riot act and sent them on their way. Because the shelter doesn't need another senior dog to take care of. And then these people just were trading their dog in, like you take an old car into a dealership to get a new car, except we're dealing with a sentient being. We're not dealing with a vehicle. We're not dealing with a machine. We're dealing with a, an actual feeling, emotional being. And But I remember hearing that story and I was just like, ooh, so mad when I heard that story. But so was the shelter. And I was like, I actually applauded the shelter for not letting them do that. Like, oh, if you're gonna dump your dog off, then you're not gonna adopt another dog from us. You know, because because now they had to now they had to pay to take care of the senior dog, and it was going to be really hard to find a home for that dog, because a lot of people don't want to adopt senior dogs unless they're very philan philanthropic or how are you philanthropic? I can't say the word. Anyways, people that are very caring and compassionate might um, adopt a senior dog, but a lot of people want puppies or they just want like a middle aged dog or, or or something like that, but they don't want an older dog. So if you're going to get a dog as a puppy then be prepared to take that dog through its entire life. And no, you cannot take that dog up to the mountains and shoot them. And you cannot do all these really cruel things because it's not convenient for you. So if, you, if, you don't, if you're looking for convenience and budget in your life, then don't get a dog. That's, I mean, that's probably not to anybody that's watching this video, but if you know people like that, steer them away. Tell them to get a stuffed animal or something, you know? Tell them to go just buy a I don't know, whatever, but to not put another creature through that torment that um, a lot of people have put them through. So those are pretty much the stages of, of their lives. And then, of course, there's the ending. Now, the I, well, I think like the true dog lover is going to be there when the dog dies. They're not going to dump the dog off at the vet and say, put my dog down and then leave. They're going to be there for they're going to hold the dog they're going to do um, their last week with the dog they're going to do things that the dog loves they're going to cherish that animal they're going to hold that dog's paw oh, God, i feel like crying um anyways they're going to be there they're going to be there for that dog um and those are the kinds of that's the kind of bonding that i'm for that's what when i do the buzz and bark animal reiki and the buzz and bark um, animal communication. This is what I want to see. I want to see people, the, the guardians and the stewards of these animals. I don't like the word owner. Um, I want to see a bonding that happens. I want to see memories built. I want to see like a, a beautiful, you know, like a beautiful relationship. That's what I want to see. 
Now, I know we all have our psychological or emotional or mental baggage, and that's for us to work on. That is not to be dumped on the dog or any pet. That's something we need to do. Now, they will project that back onto us, and that is part of the process. That's why I do coaching as well. But if you... Okay, so dogs can come into our lives like a little bodhisattva or an earth angel, whatever you want to say. And they help us heal what's, what our inner wounds are. So it doesn't matter how bad your childhood was. You cannot blame that on the dog. You cannot dump all your problems on an animal or a child or any of those things, right? You need to work on yourself. And so one of the things that animals will do when you're learning to bond with them is they will have you work on yourself. They are coming into your life for a specific reason, and it's not just so you can go to the park and show off, look, I have a dog, I'm really cool. That's not what they're about. Now, they'll do that if you want. Like, if you want to be on that superficial level with them, that's what they'll do. But again, that's not what I'm about. And, you know, when I'm doing the animal communication, when I'm doing the animal Reiki, when I'm doing all the stuff that I do for animals, it's to help people be on the deepest level possible with another species. So if that is something that you like, then definitely support this channel. Um, sign up with a session with me. I'm not going to take too many in May, but if you want to, I, I am taking clients in May and I'm taking clients in early June and then I'm going back to Washington State um, at the end of June and in early July and I probably won't start taking clients again until the middle of July. So if you're interested in that, I, I'm not doing my coaching program yet. I'm just doing individual coaching. I need to be more settled before I can start the whole program. Um, but the coaching sessions are kind of like when you sign up for an animal communication session. You just sign up one at a time. Um, the program will be a package and you know you sign up for the whole package, you pay for the whole package and then you get like several coaching sessions and then we have like you know there's a lot of papers, I mean like homework and, and things and so there's a development, we assess where you are at the beginning and then where you are at the end and so you're taken to the next level with bonding with your pet. So thank you for being here, again subscribe, like, share, um, leave a comment. Um, I think I'm going to leave a donation link as well if you want to donate to the work that it takes to do this channel. I would appreciate that. Um, thank you and have a wonderful week with you and your pet bonding. Bye for now.